there are four combinations of fast, slow, favored, and disfavored reactions. For the favored situation, we're going to go ahead and start out by putting the reactants and products in the same positions thermodynamically. So here we're in the favored manifold thermodynamically. In the next slide, we'll look at the unfavored situation. But in the favored situation, the products are lower in energy than the starting materials. Now, for a favored but slow reaction, the kinetic barrier is very high. So we might see something like this, where the kinetic barrier is way, way up high. And so the starting materials, even though the reaction is favored, don't necessarily want to get over that hump. But a good example of this is the conversion of hydrogen and oxygen to water. Thermodynamically favorable process, but one that doesn't occur without a kick because the reactants and products, because the reactants are separated from the products by a very high kinetic barrier. On the other hand, for a favored but fast reaction, we have the situation now where the kinetic barrier is very small, right? Where the difference between the transition state and the reactants is very small. And in this case, we would have a very favorable, very fast reaction. And a number of reactions exhibit this property for, uh, for a reason that we'll discuss in an upcoming lecture called the Hammond principle or the Hammond postulate. Now, if we want to think about the unfavored manifold, we can have the same two situations. So in thinking about unfavored reactions, I'm going to go ahead and place the reactants at the same level and the products at the same level. And take note that I've placed the products below, I've placed the reactants, excuse me, below the products. In doing that, we can again have two situations. We can have a very high kinetic barrier or a relatively low kinetic barrier. And both of those situations can exist. So in the case on the right, what you see is a very high, very, very high kinetic barrier for the starting materials, and a reaction that, if it's going to go, is probably going to go from the products back to the reactants. And here you see a reaction that's even easier for the products to get back to the reactants, owing to the small kinetic barrier on this side. Of course, the kinetic barrier from the reactants as, as we've represented them here over that transition state is still relatively high. But the point is that the two factors are independent of one another. Thermodynamic and kinetics are two independent factors. A quick point I wanted to make on this slide is that enantiomers, which we've seen before as non-superimposable mirror images, right, actually exhibit identical energies and identical reactivities, assuming we don't bring another chiral compound into the mix. So two enantiomers that can undergo the same reaction will exhibit the exact same reaction coordinate diagrams because they start out at the same energy and they give the same products. So just to represent that like that, this would be, for instance, the SN2 reaction of two chiral bromides that are enantiomeric to one another with the same nucleophile. They would both exhibit the exact same reactivity profile because they are the exact same energy and they form identical products, or they form enantiomeric products, I should say. So because enantiomers have the same energy and in going from starting materials to products, we're enantiomeric the whole way the energies of both reactions are completely identical. So I wanted to start talking now about how molecular orbitals come into play in chemical reactivity. And it's actually a very profound way molecular orbitals affect chemical reactivity. So we've seen in, <clears throat> so we've seen in chapter one six kinds of molecular orbitals that we dealt with. And I just wanted to go over these really quick and look at some structures in which they can be found. 
we're going to think about these molecular orbitals as combining with one another to produce chemical reactivity. So it's the flow of electrons from filled to empty orbitals that dictates reactivity. So if you take a look here, these are the common filled orbitals, the three common filled molecular orbitals, and they correspond basically with Lewis structural elements that you've already seen. So the N orbital, for instance, on this alkoxide, hopefully you can recognize, corresponds to one of the lone pairs. So the alkoxide has three lone pairs, and they're all in N, or non-bonding, hybrid orbitals. So you might see these called simply hybrid orbitals or non-bonding orbitals. All those really refer to the same thing, this N orbital, a non-bonding pair of electrons. And these are, of course, very high energy uh, electrons being non-bonding. They're not stabilized relative to the electrons that we would find, for instance, in a bare atom. Sigma orbitals are also filled and common orbitals, and those look like this, for instance, a CH bond would look like that. And these can also act as nucleophiles, as electron donors. They're actually relatively low in energy, but they still can, in many cases, react as nucleophiles, and we'll see examples of that a little later on. And then finally, the pi-type orbital, which is a little bit tough to draw, but looks something like this, where we have that nodal plane in the plane of the molecule, is a third kind of nucleophilic orbital. And you'll often see the pi orbital act as an electron donor or nucleophile in a reaction. So these are the three common filled orbitals, n, sigma, and pi.